Hey, this is John Orberg, and this is Passage to Wisdom. And I want to start today with a question. What are you looking forward to? Not just anything that you're looking forward to. Not just what are you looking forward to today or tomorrow or next week or next month. What are you most looking forward to? Not just what are you hoping for. What is your meta hope? What is your hope beyond all hopes? And is what you're looking forward to worthy of the devotion of your one and only life? We have been thinking about that topic over the last week or so. A lot of you will have seen Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook is promising now a new entity called the Metaverse. And there have been all kinds of articles. I was reading one in the New York Times today where an eight-year-old describes what the Metaverse is going to look like. And I think probably eight-year-olds have the best handle on it. Metaverse is such an interesting word. We live in what we call a universe. And that word is full of meaning. Uh, verse comes from the old Latin word uh, versus, which meant to plow a furrow or to reverse that plow, to reverse the line. It was a single line, a versus, uh, left versus right. And then that came to mean a single line of writing a Bible verse or a verse of poetry. And part of what is embedded in that word universe is the notion that there is meaning to it, that it is a story, that it is headed someplace. And not just that, it is a universe, that it, it, it was meant to be an expression of unity. There is a oneness to it. All truth is God's truth. We are meant to be united within ourselves and then to each other and then to our God. We live in a universe. That's the claim. That's the idea. And then that word meta captures our reality. Meta is a Bible word too, actually. Uh, meta could mean with, God with us. It could also mean that which comes after. And that sense that there is a world that lies beyond us, that lies before us, that will come after our time in this world. And all of that leads up to what I want to share with you today. This is the very last letter in C.S. Lewis's book, The Screwtape Letters. I've enjoyed doing these passages to wisdom so much that this could easily be done every day for the rest of all of our lives. But it's time to move on. I'm ending this series today. I'll take a couple of weeks off to get ready. And then on the Monday of Thanksgiving week, I'm going live. Nancy's going to join me. And we're going to do a celebration. That will be the one-year anniversary of this community of the withered hand. I can't, God can, I think I'll let him. And then after that, we'll have a series to go into the Advent season together. But this is the way the screw tape Letters ends. And it is a remarkable uh, imagining of what happens when a human being comes to the end of their life. Old Uncle Screwtape riding to Wormwood after his patient, the human being, has just died in the war. My dear, my very dear Wormwood, my poppet, my pig's knee, how mistakenly now that all is lost you come whimpering to me to ask whether the terms of affection in which I address you meant nothing from the beginning. Far from it. Rest assured, my love for you and your love for me are as like as two peas. I have always desired you as you, pitiful fool, desired me. The difference is, I am the stronger. I think they will give you to me now, or a bit of you. Love you? Why, yes. As dainty a morsel as ever I grew fat on. And that is the parody of love, love as desire, love as the enriching only of the self. You've let a soul slip through your fingers. The howl of sharpened famine for that loss re-echoes at this moment through all the levels of the kingdom of noise, down to the very throne itself. It makes me mad to think of it. How well I know what happened at that instant when they snatched him from you. There was a sudden clearing of his eyes, was there not? as he saw you for the first time and recognized the part you had had in him and knew that you had it no longer. Just think, and let it be the beginning of your agony, what he felt at that moment, as if a scab had fallen from an old sore, as if he were emerging from a hideous shell-like tetter, as if he shuttled off for good 
and all a defiled, wet, clinging garment. By hell, it is misery enough to see them in their mortal days taking off dirty and uncomfortable clothes and splashing in hot water and giving little grunts of pleasure, stretching their ease limb. What then of this final stripping, this complete cleansing? And that's part of what we have to look forward to, to be free of sin. Not just free of a guilty conscience, to be free of being tempted by that which is wrong. For ego or greed or lust or revenge or small-mindedness or comparison or envy, to have no more interest at all, for it just to drop away like scales. That's worth looking forward to. And then Screwtape goes on. Did you mark how naturally, as if he'd been born for it, the earth-born vermin entered the new life? How all his doubts became in the twinkling of an eye ridiculous, to be free of doubt. I know what the creature was saying to itself. Yes, of course, it was always like this. All horrors have followed the same course, getting worse and worse, forcing you into a kind of bottleneck till, at the very moment when you thought you must be crushed, behold, you were out of the narrows, and all was suddenly well. The extraction hurt more and more, and then the tooth was out. The dream became a nightmare, and then you woke. You die and die, and then you are beyond death. How could I ever have doubted it? In 1 Corinthians 13, that great chapter on love, Paul talks about how now we see through a glass darkly. And the word that he uses for darkly, the Greek word enigma, we get our word enigmatic from that enigma, to think that for Paul, for Paul, all that could be known now was enigmatic. His faith was enigmatic. But the day is coming, he said, when we will no longer see through a glass darkly, enigmatically, we will see face to face. As he saw you, he also saw them. I know how it was. You reeled back dizzy and blinded, more hurt by them than he had ever been by bombs. The degradation of it, that this thing of earth and slime could stand upright and converse with spirits before whom you, a spirit, can only cower. Perhaps you had hoped that this awe and strangeness of it would dash his joy, but that is the cursed thing. The gods are strange to mortal eyes, and yet they are not strange. He had no faintest conception till that very hour of how they would look and even doubted their existence. But when he saw them, he knew that they had always, that he had always known them and realized what part each one of them had played at many an hour in his life when he had supposed himself alone. So that now he could say to them one by one, not who are you, but so it was you all the time. All that they were and said at this meeting woke memories. That dim consciousness of friends about him, which had haunted his solitudes from infancy, was now at last explained. That central music in every pure experience, which had always just evaded memory, was now at last recovered. Recognition made him free uh, of their company almost before the limbs of his corpse became quiet. Only you were left outside. We will be free from loneliness. We will see the spiritual reality, the great cloud of witnesses, the angelic hosts that now we dimly sense. And when that moment comes, we will know. And then this, he saw not only them, he saw him. This animal, this thing begotten in a bed could look on him. What is blinding, suffocating fire to you is now cool light to him, is clarity itself, and wears the form of a man. You would like, if you could, to interpret the patient's prostration in his presence, his self-abhorrence and utter knowledge of his sins. Yes, Wormwood, a clearer knowledge even than yours. On the analogy of your own choking and paralyzing sensations when you encounter the deadly air that breathes from the heart of heaven. But it's all nonsense. Pains he may still have to encounter, but they embrace those pains. They would not barter them for any earthly pleasure. We will see him. We will see God.
we will see Jesus face to face. I've never had a, a vision of heaven or of God, but years ago, not real long after Dallas Willard died, one time I was in a church service and, and we were singing, we were worshiping and singing a song about being around the throne, about beholding God. And what I had in that moment was a glimpse of Dallas's face when Dallas is looking at Jesus. And there was such a sense of awe and wonder and, and overwhelmed devotion that just that sight alone was overwhelming to me. We will join that great cloud. Dallas and Dad and Goldie, and David Hubbard, Max. I talked to my friend Brian yesterday who just lost his mom. To my friend Corky last week who just lost hers. Those that we love. And our broken, splintered world will become united. And our broken, shattered souls will be cleansed and healed and made whole. And the awful pain of our lives will somehow be set right and made glorious. And the darkness will turn to light. Gang, that's worth looking forward to. That's the promise. That's the wisdom. I love you.